Okay. Got it? Hello and welcome. Hello and welcome to the How to Flip Furniture for Fun and Profit trail tutorial. This is the second of six uh, online masterclasses that are being run this weekend in the name of fashion flipping and fixing the planet. And my name is Andrew and I am one of the co-founders of the Garage Sale Trail. Uh, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, the Garage Sale Trail acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land and sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Um, to kick things off, please feel free to jump into the chat box into, and introduce yourselves and let us know where you're from. Um, big thanks for taking time out of your Saturday to uh, learn about this wonderful subject. Uh, we're delighted that there's well over 200 uh, registrations for this session from around the country. So hello to everyone from WA and Tassie and the Territory, Queensland, South Australia, New South Wales, and the ACT. Uh, just to make sure you are able to view the session today in the the, in the way that it's intended. Uh, if you go to your top right-hand corner of screen, <clears throat> you'll see a little icon um, view. J jump into the view, um, click on the view icon and select speaker view. Okie dokie. So, as you may know, um, the trail tutorials are a part of Garrosale Trail the team who have put this all together. And this weekend marks the beginning of our month long festival, celebrating all things secondhand. For those of you who don't know, Garrow Sale Trail is a not-for-profit and it's been around for over a decade now, organizing communities to host Garrow sales right across Australia. And this year for the first time, the event is happening over three weekends. This weekend with trail tutorials, followed by two weekends of garage sales. And it's all about treasure hunting, meeting the neighbors, decluttering, uh, finding bargains, finding weird, wonderful uh, items, and perhaps making a few bucks. But there's also a serious side to it. And that is this, how the small actions we can make, whatever in whatever aspect of our life it is, in this case, um, what we buy, the, the actions that they take can have a really big impact when combined and a big positive impact on the planet, which is desperately needed right now. And in the instance of Garrow sales, it's all about extending the life of stuff, keeping stuff out of landfill and maximizing the earth's resources. And each year, uh, Garrow sale trail keeps over 3 million kilograms of stuff going from landfill. And it's, all comes together with the support of over 100 local governments around the country, uh, the New South Wales EPA and PayPal. And this, as I said, is the second trail tutorial of six sessions happening this weekend. And if you haven't signed up for uh, any of the other trail tutorials, uh, it's not too late. There are, here, here on screen is a bit of a breakdown of what's still to come. Smart women choose sustainable fashion, make selling, reselling your side hustle, how to host a garage sale and how to host a virtual garage sale. Uh, if you feel so inspired, pull out your phone. As we've all learned to do, use a QR code over the course of COVID-19 pandemic and this QR code will lead you to the registration page. I'll just wait on that just for a moment, so if anyone's feeling so inclined. Uh, Okie dokie. So with 
the housekeeping out of the way and a bit of an introduction about who we are and what we do, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Kelly Amati. Kelly is from the Shiner Creative Workshops and she has been hunting at garris around garage sales, op shops, markets, tip shops, car boot sales, you name it, for many years. She's very passionate about saving unwanted items from landfill and has a love for all things vintage and secondhand. The subject we're going to learn about today, Kelly, is all over. She's been teaching it since 2015. Uh, I'm just going to hand you over now to Kelly to teach us all about how to flip furniture for fun and profit. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Barbara, for all the work you've done, and thank you for including me and inviting me along today. Um, I would like to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people. Um, I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners where I work. Um, I'd also like to pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and the Aboriginal elders of all other communities that may be here today. Um, I'm Kelly, she, her, based in Coburg. Shiner Creative Workshops is really just my garage converted into a workshop where I grab everything I think I can save and um, flip it. So by flipping, I mean selling, buy or get for free, buy, buy low and make a few dollars on it. And um, refurbishing furniture, you've got to know why you're doing it. So if you want to save a true antique or a piece, you're going to spend a lot more time and money and effort in that piece. Um, but I'm talking about how to flip furniture for a little side hustle. For people who've never done it before, it can be quite overwhelming and quite scary. And I just want to break it down to the absolute basics for people who've never done it before. There's a dollar in it. Um, you're doing a good thing for the planet. Everybody's a winner. If we try and realise that people don't just buy secondhand because of their financial situation, buying secondhand is a really positive move. It gives you a light footprint and it, it also makes your home a very creative and unique place. And I just feel so good doing it. So um, that's me. I'm self-taught in furniture flipping, mo mostly because there is so much information. The internet is amazing, but also connecting with other people is a fantastic way to learn. Um, so I've been doing this just by myself for about 20 years. Um, in 2015, my husband and I opened a secondhand shop. So by doing that, we knew there was a dollar in it. And I started teaching furniture painting to support the shop. So I got, I got pretty experienced in furniture painting enough that I could teach other people. A lot of people would come in and say, oh, I'm not very creative or oh, I've never done anything like this before. And I'm here to tell anybody who's interested, it is the most teachable, learnable skill. It is so easy. Um, you just have to find your little niche, find what you're good at or what you're interested in. Um, the biggest question I get asked, because I do a lot of these little sessions for free, why do you tell other people how they can make money flipping furniture? Because you know, you're creating competition for yourself. I promise you there is enough space for all of us. There is so much to save. If I painted something every single day, I can't even make a dent in what is getting wasted. So please join me and start flipping things, whether it's just to make a few dollars or if you if you want to get serious and you have visions of, of building a business, um, as I said, it can just be a hobby. Most hobbies cost you money. This one can make you a few bucks. Or if you're serious and you, you hone your skills, you can absolutely turn this into um, a business for yourself. So um, that's why I'm sharing the information for free. If you Google waste statistics, it's overwhelming. And um, this is something you can actually do. It's something that makes a difference. Um, I will go down to sourcing. So obviously this is the garage sale trail. Garage sales are a fantastic way to source your items and to sell as well. But at the moment, we'll talk about sourcing. I source from everywhere. If you're getting started in furniture flipping um, and you don't have a lot of money to spend, the best place to source is just ask friends, family and neighbours, do you have any unwanted furniture? They will give it to you. Um, everybody's got a garage with a few things in it that they no longer need. So you can definitely start for free. And the biggest thing I would say is you don't have to go out and buy expensive paints and varnishes. Often just by flipping, you can start with a good clean. And there's a few little tricks. Um, 
for example, in the Woolies or Coles aisle, they get these little stainless steel soap pads with the pink, the pink soap. And I actually snip these in half and get a couple of goes out of each one. Um, they are brilliant for chrome. You don't need to buy expensive chrome cleaners. This might be the trick for you. And if you can, if you can clean up a piece and, and have it looking nice, you can easily um, sell that item. Most things will clean up with a product called Magic Eraser. These also are in Coles, Woolies, or even the $2 shops sell these. These will take, um, often take uh, biro marks off vinyl or um, vinyl with a bit of um, texture. These Magic Erasers are amazing, used very gently and sparingly. So I'm going to show you a few of the products I use. Don't feel the need to write everything down. Um, there is a PDF available. Um, where you logged in for the email, all of these things are noted down. If or you can always um, send us a message through social media if you have any questions. But I'm showing you how cheap it is to get started. So even before you learn um, painting techniques and that cleaning an item and relisting it is a brilliant way to start your flipping journey. If you do want to sort of evolve and learn a few more things, there's definitely painting, restoring wood, all those things. And you can definitely learn a lot by joining um, specialist Facebook groups. So for example, my favorite era is anything sort of retro, mid-century, um, but definitely there's experts. I'm, I'm not the world's you know, leading wood restorer, but there's people on these particular Facebook groups that are so happy to share their advice with you that you can, you can just, mine their knowledge which is fantastic um i'll try and follow my list a little bit but please jump in if you have any questions yeah be, um, i mean pardon me kelly i'm just going to jump in here with, a, yes. with to say some of those products that you've just referred to um we've just put in the chat for anyone listening um a link to a list of all the different things that um kelly is referring to today so if anyone would like that um jump into the chat box and you'll be able to get a list of the really useful things that Kelly's pointing out. Yeah, so thank you for that. So um, we're talking about garage sales. So I'll often go to a garage sale and um, I'll see that people have a heap of stuff that they no longer want. And I'm never, I'm, I'm not really a, a big haggler. That's not really my thing. But being honest, you walk into the garage sale, people don't want these things anymore. So you can give a cheeky offer, always be really polite, really respectful. Um, but if the person wants top dollar for their item, you can always say, look, if that doesn't sell, give me a ring and leave your name and number. You might get a phone call later that evening. Look, it didn't sell. You can have it for 50 bucks or whatever. So sourcing your items, especially if you're starting small, um, you can be a little bit, a little bit creative with how you source your items. So again, so if friends and family, raid, raid their unwanted stuff, look around your own home, what you're not using. Um, Garage sales are fantastic. Sounds to me, it sounds to me, Kelly, like you are quite a good haggler if you're suggesting to, uh, no, <laughs> to never, sellers that if they don't sell their stuff. I'm not hardball because I don't enjoy being on the receiving end of hardball, um, which I'll get to later when we talk about selling. But with garage sales, um, as I said, I've got my own things that I really particularly like, but there's a few um, stories that I've heard. So there is... You, you find your niche. So I'm, I don't have kids, so I don't really know about children's toys or, or children's movies or anything like that. But I do know of Harry Potter. I've never read the book, but I do know there was a book. Um, the first 500 editions were printed with a typo. So if you're at a garage sale and you see a box of kids' books, wander over to them, pick up the Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and look on page 53. If page 53 has a list of things that Harry needs. And if one wand is printed twice, that copy of that book could be worth up to 20,000 pounds, which is around $36,000 in Australian um, money. So there, there are things to be found. Now that's just one example of wonderful, amazing things you can find. Now, not everything is obviously gonna be worth $20,000, but I did nab myself a nice little $5 piece of Batossi. These bargains are still out there. And I, I show, like I laugh every time I see this because it's 
pretty strange, but I've seen these listed anywhere from $600 to $1,500. They're highly, highly collectible if you're into the mid-century kitschy sort of stuff. This is an Italian piece of pottery. Not everybody's cup of tea, but this is definitely the kind of thing someone cleaning out Nonna's garage would definitely put on a table for five bucks. And you, if you know a few things, so the riches is in, are in the niches, so you don't have to be an expert in everything. Maybe tools are your passion, maybe books, first editions, maybe Italian pottery, whatever it is, have a few little go-tos where you can find out what to look for at a garage sale. You can definitely um, go to eBay, but look at the sold items only. Don't look at what things are listed for because that's really not helpful to you. Go to the sold items, see what things sold for. And then what I would do, and I do do in my, in my phone, I have notes in, and just a couple of things to look forward to. Is it a, a piece with a serial number? So I'll just dot that serial number down. And if I see something, I can just double check it. And then I know I've got a, a gem at a garage. But they're, they're one in a while, and we all know that. They're, they're the unicorns. The real things I make money on are cheaper end furniture that I add value to. Because it is cheaper end, people discard it very, very cheaply. It means nothing to them. I'll get, um, I consistently do um, the Kmart bureaus that I get at garage sales for $10 and $20. I consistently do those up, stage them as bars and get $150, $160. They're my bread and butter. They're not, um, you know, they're not high quality items, but I can do enough to them. There's some um, examples on my Instagram if you're interested, but you can add value to cheap items. So it's not all about saving the antiques because um, let's be honest, most people selling secondhand furniture think it's worth a fortune and most people buying secondhand furniture want it for nothing. So finding that balance. There are true gems to be found, especially with the mid-century stuff and even um, painting, painting something mid-century can actually devalue it. So um, if you find something you don't know what it is, but you think it's a bit special, maybe it just feels quality or it feels a bit special. Um, if you don't know about Google Lens, you download that and you take a photo of it and it does a reverse image search. So that's how you can you can find an item. So for example, the blue cat, if I didn't know anything about Potosi, but I just had a feeling, would take a picture of it, reverse image search, and then it would pop up. Um, what that item is or very closely related things and that would definitely give me an idea um, and then from then if it really is a true a true piece maybe I don't maybe I don't do anything to it to flip it maybe the original condition is actually better but if it's really like a lower end piece like I say there's so many things you can do and as I said cleaning is the first step um, before you do anything um, I fix a lot of cane furniture that's very very popular at the moment I get a lot of cane. It's um, very, very easy to fix with a hot glue gun or the little unravelly pieces. Hot glue gun is your friend. Do a nice job with that. Um, spend a tiny bit more money and get a cordless hot glue gun and you will never regret that purchase. Um, if there's a piece of cane missing, um, if you're going to paint it, you can actually use the hot glue to make the missing piece. Or if you're just going to refinish um, a, a plain cane piece that has been unpainted you can certainly hot glue it back into place and I highly recommend one of these furniture oils just a, a Bunnings job and this will make your cane piece look new you trim off all the little um, you trim off all the little pieces and then you've restored that piece of furniture ready to use again the difference is unbelievable um, so Kelly. Can I yep. jump in with a question there? So typically how long might, how many hours might you spend? I know every piece of furniture is different, but in the, in the instances of the cane furniture yes. that you were just talking about, how many hours might you spend um, getting that to a point where you feel like you can uh, have added enough value to, to make it worthwhile? And the answer is honestly based on what you paid for it and the condition of it. So for for me, if I, I get things so cheap because I, I know where to shop, so the garage sales, and I'm not scared of a rough piece because I'm quite experienced. If it was too rough um, and you didn't have a lot of experience, it's not going to be worth your time. For me personally, if I'm going to keep a piece, I'll take it in almost any condition because I know it's worth the effort. But to flip a piece of furniture, if it's... um. 
it really is just getting out there and having a go um because when it comes to restoring furniture it just takes as long as it takes and it, it takes as long as it takes to get to a level where you're happy with it to sell it but genuinely um gluing unraveled bits and giving something a little bit of a drink makes it look new again and you can easily double your money in an afternoon i have a couple of times um and i think they're on my instagram as well i'll go and get a piece of cane furniture for 30 dollars. i will give it a drink which takes five minutes and sits out in the sun maybe glue a few things 10 minutes and i will stage it with a few pops props and then we'll get to selling um stage it a little bit of a description so I will buy it for $30 and the same afternoon I'll have it listed for $130. And that's a consistent, easy way to flip furniture. Um, the trick is not keeping everything that you, you fix and flip as well. Like you've got to know when to walk away because otherwise you just end up on that show hoarders and it's just too much. So I will definitely, um, I'm at the, at the point where I'm one in, one out. If I find something I really want to keep, something's got to go. I price to sell as well. I don't try and get top dollar for everything, like things moving through. Um, so I've lost where I was, but we'll we'll go back. Um, we we're talking about not everything at a garage sale is is a gem, but as I said, if you know your niches, um, you'll know where to look. Like my husband's a massive record collector, and he'll he'll go straight to the vinyl crate, and he'll be great digging or whatever they call it. And then he'll be pulling out um, and he'll be looking at serial numbers and he's got his Discogs um, mobile phone and he knows. So the records, I walk past those and I go for cane furniture. I go for mid-century anything. Kitchenalia is a bit of a, um, a passion of mine. So it, it finds your thing. There is room for all of us here, especially if you've got kids. Um, kids grow out of things. Kids are fattish, they change. But you might know, like my sister would know that a, a particular toy costs $200 and I would be oblivious. But if you can clean something up and relist it, um, that's flipping. And there's a really good dollar in it, as I keep saying. Um, so that's that's um, mostly the cleaning. And these honestly are my go-to. You cannot go past these cheap, easy items. If you're going to get a little bit more um, into where you're gonna start sanding and, and refinishing things, I would highly recommend you watch a few tutorials on YouTube. Um, you don't go straight for the sanding gun every time. Sandpaper is expensive, it's dusty, not everybody's got a setup where they can sand. So I would highly recommend getting a heat gun. Looks like a hairdryer, but it isn't, it's really hot, and a scraper. And most things will, will scrape off, whether it's a paint, an old chip lacquer, scrapers are much better for the planet much cheaper for you quicker and um, I get a kick out of doing it too because it's, it's actually quite um, satisfying but definitely use the scraper before you go straight for sanding if it's um if it's a veneer always sand by hand don't be tempted to get the um to get the uh, electric sander out because you will go through that veneer and then then there's really not much you can do except paint it um, when it comes to furniture painting, that's a whole other thing. I, I always say check what you've got before you slap paint on it because you can devalue a piece, but most pieces of furniture are not worth an awful lot of money and look beautiful freshened up. I personally use a chalk paint, an Australian made one, but there are dozens you can use. I do use this one because it is beautiful and you can slap it on almost anything without sanding. So if something is already varnished, that um, orange pine furniture that you see everywhere. It's beautifully made, but the orange pine is so 80s and dated, but so well made and so substantial. You do not have to sand that varnish off before you use a chalk paint. This stuff is self-priming and it will stick. So what is the name of that brand? This is called Messi and Frank, um, but all chalk paints have got a chalky like texture, nothing to do with chalk boards. They've got a chalky texture and they stick. And then you can varnish over the top and you get a beautiful, a beautiful finish. Um, you can also use chalk paint to do a lot of um, techniques and styles. Like a, um, also in Melbourne, I find what sells is very, very different to what used to sell when I had my shop in New South Wales. We were on a coastal town. And definitely when we get to the selling bit, um, 
what you look for to flip, have a bit of a vision. But like I said, this is incredibly teachable and learnable. And if you pay attention to what you pay attention to, you'll find your niche and find what you enjoy. You might as well flip the furniture you you like and enjoy rather than um, sanding all the sanding all the pieces that don't inspire you. Um, for example, if you had kids, you might really focus on children's bedroom furniture and making them unicorn themed or or whatever kids are into and I don't I don't know that that's why there's room for all of us I do pretty well and I don't like this is my full-time job I'm busy all the time and I still don't I don't try and be everything to everybody I stay in my lane because I'm busy doing that but there's plenty of room for everybody um, there is chalk paints there is also there's mineral paints which are beautiful to use um, um, I've only just started trying mineral paints. And here's a brilliant tip too. I tell you about all the items you can buy, the cleaning supplies, all Bunnings, Coles, Woolies. But if you're going to try um, these paints, they can be quite expensive. So you go onto Facebook Marketplace and you can type in D-Stash. So you can buy other people's failed hobbies for an awful lot less than going and buying retail items. Um, and that's a really good idea to do before you know this is something you want to do. Don't, um, you know, spend your life savings on a big kit of things that you might not really get into this or you might, you might find it's not that rewarding or you're just not enjoying it as much. Just start small, get a few. And when you do sell and you get a few results, you definitely, it is quite inspiring to keep going. Um, you don't need to spend a lot of money. As I said, I go to a lot of car boot sales, um, there's a trash and treasure sale in Coburg for anyone in Melbourne. It's, it's just amazing. But even if they're not in your area, um, I would highly recommend just buying something little like a little multi-tool kit. These are from Ikea for about $12 or $15. And they've got everything, the Allen key set, the adjustable wrench, and you can tighten furniture, undo furniture, I don't go anywhere without that in my car because if I spot something at a garage sale, if I can get two of the legs off, I can get it in my boot. And if I can get all of the legs off, I can get more in my boot. So I take, I never go anywhere without this in my car because I can actually dismantle almost anything with this tiny little set. Um, and even the $2 shops, like we're not trades people. We don't need to spend the big money on tools. I've got this little whiz bang tool from the $2 shop. And when you slide it in, it's got every imaginable head. Like this was $2. And I have used this for years. And it is like, I, you know, it's, it's like a safety blanket. It's got everything you ever need. So when you're starting small, you do not have to spend a lot of money. Um, so I do, I do do a bit of painting. I do do a bit of refurnishing, uh, refurbishing. Can I jump in on the painting, Kelly? Yes, please. So what's an example? When would you use um, the, what, what did you call them, enamel? Was it enamel paints? Or, or? No, no, so chalk paint is my main go-to. You the and there was a chalk paint and then there was another paint. There's a mineral paint as mineral well. Paint. Just a softer, a softer look. Right. Um, I was going to ask, what's, a, what's some different situations you'd use a different, those two different paints? Yes, yeah, so um, the biggest the biggest reason to use some of these paints is um, furniture that's in great condition. Um, a lot of downsizers move into smaller apartments, and I do find that a lot of the old-fashioned furniture is dark brown, but when people downsize in a smaller apartment, they want something nice and bright. These paints go straight over the top of, um, of any varnished item. So the prep is minimal. You take the handles off and you just get to the fun bits straight away, which is amazing. So that's why I would paint things to brighten them up because also people inherit a lot of furniture. For example, I, I inherited something from my mum. It was this brown kind of, you know, brown desk. It, it's just not my cup of tea and it would sit in the shed or the spare room or the guest room. But by painting it, people say, oh, you can't paint that. Yeah, you can actually, if you own it, you can paint it. Um, if you're not looking to sell it and you'll use it, slap some paint on it. It's only paint. And if you change your mind, you can paint it a different colour or you can sand it off. But definitely people downsizing, number one, they're the people who like to paint because their furniture is good quality. 
good condition, maybe has sentimental value, but just doesn't suit their home anymore. A lick of paint can do, we all know from all of the renovation shows what a lick of paint can do. So paint is my friend, um, except with the mid-century stuff. I very, very rarely paint anything mid-century simply because you devalue it. Um, often you can buy these um, pretty expensive tea coils, Scandinavians, and a little tin like that would easily cost you about $35. But you can go online and get a recipe for a homemade tea coil where you can buy boiled linseed oil and some mineral turps, about six bucks each, and you can have two litres for $12. Or you can buy this little tin for around 35. So definitely um, before you go spending your money, Google homemade Danish oil or homemade tea coil and see if there's, you may, you may even have all the products you need um, in your shed. Things like rust removers and kill rusts, there are some excellent products, um, but I try and do water-based wherever I can. Just simply better for the planet, cleanup is easier, better for breathing issues. Um, I definitely recommend if you've got something rusty, go to the supermarket and buy two litre bottles of white vinegar in a bucket and soak it in. You will be amazed how well vinegar works removing rust off things. Um, and it's also, I use it a lot of those camping jaffle. I buy those all the time. They're always rusty. Vinegar, polish them up and you can, you, you get them for $2 a garage sale. You can consistently sell them for $30. Um, people love them for camping trips, but just by putting them in the vinegar, so I know it's food safe, it's, um, it revives something, and then a, a light spray of oil and it doesn't rust again. Um, you know the jaffle makers I mean? They, they, it's a, such a silly thing, but it's one of my consistent buy and sells. It's so silly, but it's just something that if I see one, I'll never walk away. I'll always grab the, the jaffle makers. Um, because they're, and they're popular, they, they're popular, per, people like to buy them? Love them. Anyone going camping? It's not the yeah, same yeah. if you haven't got a baked bean jaffle. So we all know that. Um, so definitely with the the Danish oil, that's a real trend at the moment. Anything that you can um, um, revive. But yeah, like like I said, if you think you've got a, a genuine piece of mid century stuff, um, join those mid century groups. Say, hey, can anyone ID this for me? Is this um is this something pretty special? But if it's veneer you know that it's probably not worth top dollar. So you can just, you can make it look a lot nicer for sure. Um, so that's, yeah. So the if you did want to get into furniture painting and um, more technique based stuff, there are so many classes around. They're often small businesses that run the workshops, um, you know, as a bit of a side thing to their retail business. That's definitely how I got started. It was an awesome way to meet people in the community with similar interests. And I have, yeah, I've stayed friends with people who, who came just for a, one or two um, furniture flipping classes, but it's a really addictive holiday, ho hobby as well. So be very aware if you get into it, you're a goner. It's, um, it's definitely something that you get a kick out of it and then you start seeing everything you can paint. So you have to be a bit disciplined. Um, I would definitely say upholstery is something that interests a lot of people, but also um, intimidates people and it actually if you start basic and small I definitely recommend having a go you can't learn if you don't have a go um, the, the one tip I've got if you are doing upholstery these are about 30 bucks but they are really hard to use they're hard on your hands um, if you spend $49 and get an electric one these do not need a compressor they're Bunnings 49 just the cheapest brand and they're like a hot knife free butter. So your result is better. It's more enjoyable to use. Um, and I highly recommend spending the extra couple of bucks on this. But that's, other than that, the cheap end of everything is actually fine to get started. I would definitely recommend writing down what you've spent and then deciding whether you're going to spend a lot of time on something. So if, you, if you're going to invest a lot of time and then work out your hourly rate, you're going to have to price accordingly. So sourcing for free or for cheap is your best friend. Using cheap, cheap but really clever but frugal ways to, to flip the furniture so you're not into a piece for a lot of money. That's a huge one. And then obviously consider your time. Um, don't do one piece and then pack everything away and do another piece. Plan. 
get your get your big um, tarp out in the carport and do three pieces in the same afternoon. That is a better use of your time so that when you are selling your pieces, um, you haven't spent hours, um, incidental hours packing up, that sort of thing. That's what I do. If um, I'll go through phases where if, I'm, if I've got the spray gun and I'm painting things, everything will be the same colour that day because it's just, it's just more, um, more common sense to do a few projects in the same colour on the same day. And then, yeah, just better use of your time for sure. Um, so that's where I source and then what I will invest in something. If it's a real piece to keep, then that goes out the window. You'll just do it till it looks lovely. Um, let me quickly look at my notes. Um, another thing, I'm not into bottles, but I heard a story the other day where a lady got a bottle at a garage sale and sold it for $2,000. So bottles are a fantastic um, hobby if you're into them. I mean, mine are usually, you know, over a night or two, you know, from the red wine section, I really don't value them, just the contents, but other people really value bottles and they're, they're very, very collectible. So definitely um, have a look at bottles, tools. Um, some tools are worth a fortune, but I wouldn't know. But if you, if you are interested in tools, you, can, you could focus on tools. You would definitely, um, a lot of garage sales, if somebody's like passed away, you know, and the partner just doesn't know anything about their hobby. I don't know if it's because people don't tell their partner what they've spent on their hobby, but the partner will sell a job lot for, um, you know, a lot of um, bargains. Just just take it away, just take it. I don't want it anymore. And if you know a lot about something, you will, you will make money. Absolutely. Um, just trying to look at my notes. So, yeah, so basically... Get, get everything you can for as low as you can. Um, do the least to it you can, um, unless you're wanting to learn and practice. I, as I said, I would definitely go and do a class, go and paint a tray, meet other people. That way, if you don't have a lot of gear or a lot of space, or maybe you don't drive, maybe you can team up with somebody. I definitely know that people refurbishing um things in groups the energy is a lot higher it's a lot more fun you get ideas you bounce off each other I've hosted a couple of painting parties here um, where people bring a project everybody chucked in $20 to pay for the paints um, I put on a lunch and we all just finished that project that we'd been looking at for a couple of weeks or a couple of months or even a couple of years so people brought things and honestly the energy is brilliant um, make everybody take a before and after photo because that's where the rewards are when you you walk away going, oh, I did it, like I finished that. Um, and that's what's addictive. You sort of get a, a rush from, hey, I can do this. Or, um, you know, it'll be in your home and someone will go, wow, where did you get that? You go, oh, I covered it myself. You know, it's kind of a nice thing to get into. But let's not forget, this makes a difference. Um, this tells people second hand is not second best. Like think second hand first, not just to save money. Um, you'll have a more unique home. You'll have things that reflect your personality and you can definitely refurbish sentimental items that aren't really your cup of tea so just learn a few skills go and do a couple of community courses or um go and go and see in your area if the if there's a tool library popping up they're popping up everywhere i'm a member of the brunswick tool library um, i fix furniture for free for people um it's usually once a month when COVID's not around and people bring their item in and it, it's a clinic, not a hospital. So if I can't fix it on the day, I'll just give them some advice what I would do. First question is, is it sentimental? Do you want to keep it? They say yes. So, well, this is worth spending money on. It's a real beautiful piece, a really beautiful piece. It's worth a lot of money. It's worth the money. Um, if people are just being responsible and trying to repair things, I'll do my very best to repair it. Um, but it's not just that event. It's meeting other people with a similar mindset to you um, there's a couple of guys who fix electronics there's a lady who does mending um, of clothing and there's just an, a brilliant group of people and if you do volunteer at um, the Brunswick Tool Library they waive your membership fee so if you're really watching your dollars by volunteering at the Tool Library you can often get a membership which means you can hire tools so if you do want to do a bigger project you don't have to buy a sander and all the business you just hire, hire them or rent them for the day um, 
but meeting other people like-minded if you like I said if you don't have a car it's a bit more difficult but so go smaller if you if you don't drive or you don't have a, a a big car just flip smaller items like kids bedside tables and um things you can you know fold down definitely see if you can you know maybe your sister wants to get into it do it as a team and it it really does get people excited and get people into this um and that's sourcing yeah so i think i think that's everything i wanted to say about sourcing um and then basically selling now you can 100 percent collect all your items do them all up and then sell them so my my first garage sale trail that i joined i was rennie street retro and i just got all my retro items that i did like but i just didn't need because i have so much and i just did rennie street retro and i sold all my retro stuff i knew i know what it's worth so i wasn't bargain of the century garage sale but people knew if they came there'd be lots of quality retro stuff at a fair price so i did pretty well i think i made weather was disgusting on the day i did it on the saturday was my good day i made 600 bucks on stuff that i just picked up at op shops and garage sales. so you could use the garage sale trail for sourcing but you can also plan next year you could have a big garage sale selling the things that you've refurbished why not um where i sell personally facebook marketplace has been excellent for me there's no fees um obviously gumtree does seem to be less now it's still good though for certain things like if um i accidentally won a platform ladder on ebay i was actually after the other items it's a long story but i ended up with a platform ladder for one dollar so i went and picked it up i put it in my driveway i put it on gumtree because i knew the guys looking for platform ladders were probably more likely to be on gumtree than facebook marketplace and overnight i got 50 bucks for it and i didn't even want it but that's it really cost me nothing so um gumtree there's less eyes there now with facebook being so um in everybody's face and everybody's pocket however if there's less eyeballs there there's less competition there so you can still snag a really good bargain for people who don't have facebook so don't ignore gumtree even though it really isn't what it used to be the trading posts of the gumtrees are sort of less popular now in my opinion but they're not done yet so keep an eye on gumtree if you're looking for specific things um i don't sell on ebay anymore just because the fees got quite high but it is an excellent resource for learning about things if you know what a piece is but you don't know how to word it or you don't know what those legs are called it's an excellent resource because the people who are listing items you can lift heavily from their text and then learn what the terms are what the tags are so that when you list on facebook marketplace you are saying the right things you want to tag your um you want to tag your things correctly simply because people are looking for them you want your people to find what you're selling um if you're not very good at writing descriptions just sit for half an hour and read some and see what sells um there's a silly example but if i paint something blue and put stencils on it i could just write painted with stencils but what i will write is i'll write um painted in a beautiful inky blue with a textured detail in a boho moroccan inspired design it works people tend to get drawn in and read a little bit more um and like i said if, if you're not very wordy just copy similar listings in your own words and it really makes a difference people um a lot of people who know what they're looking for will save tags and then when you list it'll pop up for them um you're you're more likely to get the money you want from the people who want to buy it rather than being lowballed um and low offers um so facebook mother is great um we'll talk about the being a little bit careful there but um if you do have a specific hobby jump onto facebook and join those specific groups my example is the retro and kitschy groups i will find something crystal craft it was like a a queensland australian brand of um knickknacks i have no interest in it at all but if i see crystal craft in any garage sale or op shop i will buy that because i know you know margie from 
such and such always buys the crystal craft on the Sunday auctions in the kitsch group. And that's, you know, um, you, it's not always about getting top dollar for me. I, if I know somebody collects something, it's actually a thrill for me to help them find their missing piece. I actually really like that as well. Of course, they like to make a dollar, but it's not always about just the money for me. So if you're not having any luck on Facebook Marketplace, explore the groups a little bit more. Join the groups, find out what people are collecting, and you will find your buyers there. And as I said, people specifically interested in something will, are more likely to pay a fair market price rather than tire kickers, as they call them, um, around Facebook Marketplace. Um, what I will 100% say is if you are trying to sell something that you flipped, even if you've just bought something and cleaned it, um, styling works and photos matter. And if you want top dollar for any item, um, first of all, what's top dollar? Well, the top dollar is the most you can get for it the quickest. I'm not, um, unless it's a really special piece, I will price it to sell. Unless it's like something incredibly collectible, I'm never going to see again. And I'll hold out for my price. Mostly, I just like to move things on. How do you know what to price it as? It's homework, unfortunately. You've always got to do it. Um, go online, see what sells in your area. So I mentioned our shop was up on a coastal um, a coastal town in New South Wales. The stuff I could sell there is completely different, unfortunately, to what happens in Melbourne. Um, the retro mid-century stuff definitely sells a lot quicker here. Anything that you can call a plant stand, even a bookcase now, I will put bookcase slash plant stand because people aren't collecting books as much anymore, but they definitely are collecting plants and they like to put them on bookcases. But by putting bookcase slash plant stand, I've got two audiences. Do you want a bookcase? Do you want a plant stand? Do you want this one? It will sell. Um, do your homework. Find out what is selling in your area. Just make a note of what um, tags they're using. You can copy that and definitely save a few items and see how long it's listed. Um, a lot on Facebook Marketplace, you can see if something sells. So if something sells within a week, you know it's a good price. If it sells within 10 minutes, it was probably too good. So if I list something for, and I don't really know what it is, but I'll list it. If I get 40 solves in 10 minutes I know that I have priced that wrong so it's up to you how you navigate that um, but I have I have definitely um, but you know sold something too cheap before I decided that was my asking price I was happy at the time I gave it to the lady she got a bargain that day but if you really are needing your money well you know um, so if you put something up for sale and you get a bite Give it five minutes before you respond, just simply because if you get three or four more bites in that minute, you know you may have underestimated what something was worth. And we're talking if you really don't know a piece, but you think it's something. Um, definitely photos matter. Try and get natural light. Try and step back from an item and put some space around it so people can really see it. Um, my first photo on Facebook Marketplace will always be slightly staged with a couple of props. Definitely, um, I did visual merchandising for years back when I was young, working in retail, living the dream of working in retail. It works and companies do spend an awful lot of money on merchandising and staging because it works. You don't have to be an expert. If you don't have any idea, just think about just tell a story on the piece. So if I sell a little retro desk, I've got a, a, a cute little um, vintage typewriter. I put that on it and a chair with it. So the first photo will be tell the story of what this piece could be in their house. The second photo is it plain, just the piece. And the biggest rule is if I have done any repairs or if there's any faults whatsoever on that piece, I will closely photograph them and mention them. Never, ever, ever don't be honest about the condition of a piece because you just, not only are you wasting everybody's time, but people will use that to lowball you. If you're honest about the piece, say this, you know, back leg has been repaired, um, reflected in price, they can't use that to lowball you and you'll get the price that you actually wanted for that item. So, and it just basically being honest is just good juju anyway, because people say, hey, I bought a desk off you, I'm looking for a such and such, do you have any? If they already trust you, you don't have to try and get that customer again. I actually have quite a few repeat sales 
um, by painting a piece of furniture. I've done a few custom colors. Um, what it actually was is I just mixed up the paint I had left, but I referred to it in my listing as custom color. And then when the person wanted another piece, they actually said, hey, I'm after another piece in this same color. Can you do that for me? I don't do a lot of, um, um, you know, commission work. I simply, because I actually don't enjoy it. I find it a lot of pressure, but the odd person who's very nice and trusts me and I trust them, I'll do, um, I'll do a little bit of commission work for them. So um, mm. stage your pieces if you want top dollar. So first shot, tell that story. Second shot, have everything um, clear from lots of different angles. Always put your measurements in your listing because otherwise Facebook, is this still available? Yes. What's the size? Then you have to do the size and you do that for seven people. Minimize your effort because the less time you spend on something, really, the bigger your profit is on anything. You put everything they need to know in their listing. They will ask you, is it available? Just say yes. If somebody says, hey, I love this, is it still available? You know that it's not just an auto question. So you've got a real bite there. So reply to them straight away. Yes, in Coburg, delivery available, local delivery available for a small fee, something like that. If you can offer delivery, I highly recommend doing it for a fee because it can be a part of the negotiation. So local delivery available for a fee means somebody without a car can pay you or somebody who can't be bothered or somebody who wants, you know, some people are just desperate to get the haggle. So they'll go, I'll give you 150. And I know it's 200, but I'll tell you what, if you buy it today, I'll deliver it for nothing. And it's only around the corner. Everybody's a winner. So I use always offer local delivery if you can. If you can't, that's okay. Um, but pictures matter. Let people see the item. Don't put before and afters in a selling um, a Facebook marketplace to sell. Don't do that because um, you're telling people it was so gummy, it was scummy before. Don't don't do that. They just want them to see how fabulous it is now. But on my Instagram, I always show before and afters because I want to inspire people. I've done this with this. If you see one, you can copy this. These are the products you use. Go for it. Um, so, Kelly, yeah. I'm I'm, I'm going to jump in here if it's okay. I've just Please. got to keep, we've just got to keep our eye on the on the clock. Oh my god, we've gone over. I do apologise. No, no, no. It's, it's absolutely you know wonderful. <laughs> Once absolutely I get started, wonderful. I don't stop. I'd love to. I'd love to put forward a few questions and encourage um, people who are watching and listening to to jump into the chat and, and yeah. fire away with any questions. Is it okay? Might just fire away with it with a few questions for you. Oh please, yes. Jennifer, um, at the beginning of the tutorial, you spoke about some of those Kmart items that you were buying and yeah. flipping. Jennifer has asked, uh, what were you mentioned painting Kmart furniture. How do you prepare yeah. it to take paint? Okay. So if, if anyone is interested to see loads of examples of this, on my Instagram, I buy or get for nothing the cheap Kmart um, furniture. It's well-designed because they've had top designers designing the lines of it, but they use pretty cheap material. So if you put a glass of water on it, it's like a, it looks like wood, but it's actually paper covered particle board and it, it goes straight away. And as soon as it's ruined, I get them for 10 bucks on Marketplace consistently. I will then, if it's damaged, a light sand, but usually straight over the top with chalk paint, any chalk paint, but I love this one because of the colors and everything. Chalk paint it. I will line the inside with vinyl contact that I get from Bunnings, five bucks a roll. Um, I will often take the handles off and spray paint them with rattle can gold, just your, your, your gold spray paint. And I will stage those little cabinets consistently. I get them for 10, 20. I never pay more than $40 for them. They take me around two hours to do and I consistently sell them styled as a bar because you always get more money if you style it as a bar for some reason. Um, I consistently sell them for 150, 160. So the Kmart furniture, if people buy it because it's cheap, but they don't value it, you can add value to it and sell it again. And on the Kmart furniture tip, um, Christine asked, what was the name of the piece of, of the bread and butter Kmart furniture that you mentioned? So if you have a look at my Instagram, they're, they're which, cabinets. Which we've just, by the way, put in, into the chat. 
Yeah, sure. It's it's so if there, anyone wants two to... door cabinets. I've done dozens of them. I don't post all of them because honestly, my Instagram feed would be really boring. <laughs> but they consistently sell. I call them uh, boho. I say they're painted in an inky blue with a textured Moroccan vibe. Like boho sells. Um, it also is fantastic because boho also means imperfect and if things aren't perfect then they're boho great like oh, nice. turn a positive nice. a negative into a positive for sure um Anne marie has asked where does kelly sell her stuff mostly facebook marketplace but like i said my when covid wasn't on the last year i did the garage sale trail and i polished up and painted up all my retro cane items my painted and i had a retro themed garage sale um, on the garage sale trail, and and if someone wanted to kind of connect with with this uh, upcycling and repairing and flipping community, and they're not in your part of the world, what are some pointers you would give? Um, Me has asked, what would you suggest to find the community if you're not in Kelly's area? Depends where you are, but there are so many little mendic cafes um, scooting up. Sometimes they're monthly, quarterly, weekly. Um, there's um there's tool libraries are popping up and if you don't see one in your area start one um, yeah, nice. yeah and, oh good karma networks are fantastic as well you can't ask for like to be paid for anything but you certainly can borrow a sander or a jigsaw or something like that or just say can somebody help me fix this and connect with people that way the good karma networks have been very good to me yeah and someone's just mentioned uh, Barbara in the chats just mentioned places in Sydney like the Bower. Um, yes, that's fantastic for all the industrial offcuts and yeah, bits and pieces. Leslie has asked, um, do people pick up from your home? Yeah, so I'm incredibly careful as a female. Um, I I will never let somebody into my house. So um, so somebody, is this, a, is this available to buy? I'll say, yes, I'm home between five and seven. Um, and my husband's usually home. If, if you know, if you're comfortable during the day, often, to be honest, if I get three people um, ask to buy it and one's a female, I'll often go with the female. Sorry if that, but just, just because I'm home alone, whatever. Um, I will always have the piece of furniture out the front in the driveway ready to go. If that's not something you can do, uh, maybe your, your neighbour's got a carport, work something out where they're not, certainly not coming through your home and seeing your other things and where you live and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I never, ever give anybody my address until, until we've definite the time. And I say, text me before you're coming and then I will give you my address. So- um, Yeah, good tips, those are. Yeah, it's just a safety thing. Yeah, um, I do take bank transfers to hold things because I find when you get messed around online, it can be exhausting by putting every single thing in the description. I also put no holds, first in, best dressed. If somebody yeah. says, can I transfer the money to hold it? I will, if you can pick it up before Sunday. Like, and then I just minimise my own. Um, I, will, I have also many, many times said, it's in the driveway, stick the money under the mat. If it's $20, they can have it, they can take it. I have never been stung. Never, yeah. never, not even once. So... <laughs> When Not you, for a $400 thing, but for 20 bucks, I don't have to wait around all day for $20. The person will take it. Most people are genuinely good. So I'm okay with that. Thank you from Leslie on um, those good safety tips around um, collection. When you referred to the Google app earlier in the... the lens, um, Google Lens, yeah. What was that called? Do, just talk people through that really briefly. Well, I haven't been using it that long, but if you go to the app store and you download Google Lens, and it's an app that goes on your phone, if I can see it, and you basically, um, you just take a photo. So you take, so it, it's basically, I'll just show you that. Yep, so it's this, is that, I don't know if that's gonna work, is it? Just the, see this one here, the Google? Yeah. And you click on there, you click on there, and there's a camera search button at the top, there's that little camera. Yeah. So then you'll take your photo of your ugly blue cat. So I don't know what it is, but I pretty think I think it might be something special. And then I'll see, I'll see what comes up. And then it will, if there's a if there's an another ugly blue cat or an ugly blue dress or 
it'll it'll give you an idea it gets you started that is invaluable is it right? um, especially if, you, if something's got lines like you know it's a mid-century chair but you can't identify it try the google lens any others that match it um there is a site to watch out there's one called first dibs don't get excited if you see your item on first dibs for a million dollars don't get excited first dibs is incredibly um inflated go to ebay see what it actually sold for and get a more realistic idea of what your your precious item might really be yeah yep sorry for talking too long i went far over please don't apologize i think it's been um judging by the reaction in the chat uh there's been a lot of fantastic response and, and interest so thank you very much um at, it's just gone three o'clock so we're going to have to wrap it up there uh i'm going to just finish up with um, putting something on screen so you can all keep in contact with um kelly here's a, just a screen grab of her instagram um account may where... i say one more thing yes you can kelly what the lady said this is just it so i just got a heap of people together and got them all in the same room to fix and mend and paint if, if there's not that in your area just do it stick on a barbecue get people to bring their tools their paints their tarpaulins like just put an invite out and you will be amazed who shows up these people care these people are doers they make For the painting party huh? painting parties yeah it sounds like a whole lot of fun it is so amazing and if you don't have a spot ask your neighbor ask you know ask someone who's got a yard you can do it honestly i did it and it it was and i'm definitely doing more it, yeah just just because no one was doing it so i've done it so and is it okay if if i say to, to people to if they've got more questions is it all right if they send you a direct message on instagram please do absolutely that would be wonderful um now if i can finish up with a, a massive uh thanks and appreciation and gratitude for kelly and her time and and passion and enthusiasm it's infectious and hard not to be touched by that thank you very much uh on screen is a qr code uh to a brief survey please feel free to open up your phone and take a pic and it'll take you to the survey uh, or in the chat now we will be putting a link to it it's always really helpful to find out um, how you found the sessions and and if you've been attending other sessions and it's all about how we can get better at what we do so please feel free to take your time uh, and and lend us your your thoughts it would be really helpful and uh that's it for today uh, and if you'd like to join any others or register to be a, a host a garage sale or to shop the trail and find some items that you might want to flip um, you can do that on the garage sale trail website thank you very much thank you so much been wonderful and um we will send out a re importantly important note we'll send out a recording of this um session uh on monday and uh any questions let us know thank you very much thanks so much